Good morning. Today's headlines. China launches unprecedented live-fire military drills surrounding Taiwan today, one day after House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited the island. In Arizona, the Republican gubernatorial primary is still too close to call. With about 80 percent of precincts reporting, find out who's leading the tight race. And Alex Jones admits calling the Sandy Hook shooting a hoax was wrong. The talk show host says media continue to ignore his stance despite him seeking to distance himself from previous statements. Boston is flying a Christian flag at City Hall. It took a Christian charity waging a five-year legal battle and a Supreme Court decision to get it there. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. Good morning, and I'm Evelyn Lee. It's good to have you with us. It's Thursday today, August 4th, and it's also one day after Nancy Pelosi left Taiwan. And China begins its military exercises today. It includes, le- it includes live firing on the waters and airspace surrounding the island of Taiwan. China, China's Ministry of Defense says the operations are to counter Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. The drills spread out across six locations, directly encircling the island. China says the drills will end this Sunday. Chinese Navy ships and military aircraft briefly crossed the Taiwan Strait median line several times Thursday morning. By midday Thursday, military vessels from both sides remained in the area and in close proximity. Taiwan officials say the drills violate United Nations rules, invade Taiwan's territorial space, and are a direct challenge to free air and sea navigation. Taiwan says it will strengthen self-defense capabilities, closely coordinating with the United States and other like-minded countries. Well, the United States is going to continue to supply Taiwan with the equipment it needs to defend itself. No doubt there's going to be a reaction to this trip from the Chinese, but we can't let China dictate U.S. foreign policy. We have long had a policy of helping uh, Taiwan defend itself and defend its sovereignty, and we will continue that policy. Taiwan's cabinet spokesman also says they were hacked. The defense ministry, the foreign ministry, and the presidential office websites were attacked. Now the government is urging the companies in Taiwan to enhance their cybersecurity. Also today, the U.S. Navy says the USS Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier will be conducting scheduled operations in the Philippine Sea in the western Pacific. That includes waters southeast of Taiwan. A U.S. Navy fleet spokesperson says this is part of the carrier's routine patrol in support of a free and open Indo-Pacific. And as Speaker Nancy Pelosi continues her trip in South Korea, today she met with their National Assembly Speaker and other senior members of Parliament. Pelosi and her South Korean counterpart vowed to support efforts to maintain a strong deterrence against North Korea and achieve its denuclearization. A joint statement was issued after the meeting in Seoul expressing concerns over the North's evolving nuclear and missile threats. Pelosi is expected to visit the joint security area near the heavily fortified inter-Korean border later today. If that visit occurs, Pelosi will be the highest level American to go to the joint security area since former President Donald Trump went there in 2019 for a meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The border is patrolled together by American-led UN command and North Korea. The U.S. Senate approved a resolution for Sweden and Finland to join NATO on Wednesday. The vote was 95 to 1. Missouri Senator Josh Hawley was the single opposition vote, and Kentucky Senator Rand Paul voted present. Here's what Senator Hawley said about his reason for opposing the ratification. It's not enough to simply say that China is the pacing threat or to say that the risk to Taiwan is real. We must do something about it. We have to prioritize. We have to focus. And that means we have to do less in Europe in order to prioritize America's most pressing national security interest, which is in Asia with regard to China. Sweden still isn't spending 2% of GDP on defense. And it doesn't plan to until at least 2028. Finland has announced a one-time defense spending boost, but it's not clear whether it will sustain those higher investments, which again are the minimal investments needed for NATO. The resolution will now head to the president's desk for his signature. The two countries are allowed to join the alliance once parliaments from all 30 members of NATO ratify the decision. It would be the most significant expansion of the alliance since the 1990s. 
ratification could take up to a year, but Canada, Germany and Italy have already approved. Russia, though, has repeatedly opposed. It's, th it's threatening military and political consequences. Arizona's race for the Republican nomination for governor is still too tight to call. With about 80 percent of precincts reporting, Trump-endorsed candidate Carrie Lake holds the lead with just over 46 percent of the vote. Her closest competitor, Karen Taylor Robson, is close behind with around 44 percent. Lake is anticipating a win. Her team posted on Twitter this morning. They used the hashtag Carizona when saying that they remain on pace for victory and are certain that the final result will be worth the wait. Robeson has the endorsement of former Vice President Mike Pence and was previously leading the close race. The winner will face Arizona's current Secretary of State Katie Hobbs in the general election. Hobbs easily won the Democratic Party with over 70 percent of the vote. And the Republican side experienced a tragic loss yesterday. Indiana Representative Jackie Walorski and two of her staff were killed in a car accident. The local sheriff's office says it was a head-on collision. The driver of the other vehicle was also killed. The crash is still under investigation. Walorski was 58. Lawmakers grieved the loss and paid tribute to her career. The flag was lowered to half staff at Capitol Hill in response to her death. President Biden issued a statement crediting Walorski for her years of public service, saying even though they may have disagreed on many issues, she was respected by members of both parties for her work. Walorski was first elected to represent Indiana's 2nd Congressional District in 2012 and served on the House Ways and Means Committee. She previously served three terms in the state's legislature. The congresswoman also served as the top Republican on the House Ethics Committee. It would have put her in line to become chair of the panel if the GOP regains a majority in the House this November. President Biden on Wednesday signed another executive order to support travel for abortions. This comes in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Secretary Becerra is going to work with states through the Medicaid to allow them to provide reproductive health care for women who live in states where, where, where abortions were, are, are being banned. The president said the order will help women travel out of state to receive abortions. He also said it streamlines the collection of key maternal health data. Biden signed the order virtually as he remained in isolation because of the CCP virus. This comes one day after the Department of Justice announced a lawsuit against the state of Idaho over access to abortion and Kansas on Tuesday voted to reject an abortion ban. And more on the Hill, renewing efforts to pin down the origins of the pandemic. Senator Rand Paul leads the first congressional hearing on gain-of-function research. And today's Iris Tao has more. Gain-of-function research has the potential to unleash a global pandemic that threatens the lives of millions. Yet this is the first time the issue has been discussed in a congressional committee. Revisiting the issue of how COVID-19 originated, Republican Senator Rand Paul leading the first ever hearing on gain-of-function research, which involves altering viruses to make them more transmissible. The American people deserve to know how this pandemic started and to know if the NIH funded research that may have caused this pandemic. The hearing comes amid intensifying Republican scrutiny on whether a leak from the Wuhan Institute of Virology in China, or WIV, caused the pandemic. The State Department has flagged circumstantial evidence of WIV's gain-of-function research on bad coronaviruses. And here's Dr. Stephen Quay with the Tassa Therapeutics testifying today. There is no dispositive evidence the pandemic began as a spillover of a natural virus in a market. All evidence is consistent with a laboratory-acquired infection. I do understand this conclusion is not widely held. And an MIT professor raising national security concerns. We are so used to thinking of pandemics as a health and safety issue that we've missed the national security implications of identifying viruses that could be deliberately unleashed to kill millions of people. But another major concern focuses on whether the National Institutes of Health funded gain-of-function research at the Wuhan facility, an allegation that NIH leadership had denied. The NIH has not ever and does not now fund gain-of-function research 
in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Do they find Dr. Barrick? The molecular biologist Dr. Richard E. Bright accuses Dr. Anthony Fauci of lying about NIH's funding ties. The statements made on repeated occasions to the public, to the press, and to policymakers uh, by the NIA director, uh, Dr. Fauci, have been untruthful. I do not understand why those statements are being made because they are demonstrably false. And experts, while urging more U.S. oversight on such research and on the funding that goes with it, also call for more attention on China's behaviors. Are you concerned with the continuation and expansion of Chinese gain-of-function research? They were doing synthetic biology on a cloning vector of the Nipah virus, which is 60 percent lethal. We just experienced a 1 percent lethal virus. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. It took a Christian charity five years and a lengthy legal battle. Now they're able to fly a Christian flag on the Boston City Hall flagpole. They did it yesterday after the Supreme Court ruled in their favor and Boston updated its flag policy. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg has the details. A Christian charity known as Camp Constitution flew a Christian flag on the Boston City Hall flagpole for the first time after being denied by the city in 2017. After a five-year legal battle, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously in May that the city of Boston violated the Constitution by refusing to fly the Christian flag while granting permission to secular flags. For 12 years, there were 284 applications, not a single denial, virtually no review, and the only reason why Camp Constitution's request to fly this flag was denied was not because of the flag itself. The symbol itself could have flown. It was how shirtless view of that flag. It was because of one word in the application, the word Christian, that preceded the word flag. Hal Shirtleff, the director and co-founder of Camp Constitution, spoke at the flag-raising ceremony on Wednesday. We're so pleased for this day. Back in 17, we wanted to have a simple ceremony to commemorate the uh, Constitution Day and Boston's rich Christian history. But I do want to give the glory to God because God's hand was in this from the very beginning. Around 200 people attended the flag raising ceremony. One of the speakers was Harry Mahet from Liberty Council, the organization that represented Camp Constitution in the lawsuits. Having grown up in a communist country, in communist Romania, having witnessed a government that was determined to stamp out religious expression from the public square at all costs, my friends, I have to tell you that we need to do anything and everything in our power to make sure that free speech and free exercise of religion always remain free and protected in this great land of ours. Boston updated its flag raising policy on Tuesday following the Supreme Court decision. They now say that a city council resolution or mayoral proclamation will be required for a flag to be raised and that the city will comply with the Supreme Court decision. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Oppressive heat is moving in on top of mass destruction in Kentucky. People there on the front lines trying to cope with the recent disaster are facing searing temperatures that feel like more than 100 degrees. People are helping each other, though, by delivering food, water, and necessities. Mass devastation for miles across multiple Kentucky counties, revealing itself as unprecedented floodwaters recede nearly a week after violent storms struck the state. What can you do when your little town is your little city's devastated? I mean, it was it was like a war zone. The mayor of the hard hit town of Fleming Neon describes the aftermath she witnessed alongside the police chief. When I was getting in my car, he said, it's not pretty. I just want you to be prepared. And I said, OK, well, I wasn't prepared. Kentucky's governor is sounding the alarm on the potentially life threatening temperatures they're now facing, but stresses response teams will not be deterred. About every two miles, there's another place distributing water that people are pulling through, putting supplies in their car. Uh, help has truly uh, shown up and it's real special uh, to see. As help pours in, the governor says more than 400 people with nothing left are now living in shelters. That is only a fraction of the overall number of displaced people. Most are with friends or with family because that's what we do uh, as Kentuckians. We're not victims here. 
We're survivors. Residents in Northern California who evacuated over the weekend are now learning they won't have homes to return to. The fire burning near Oregon border has claimed at least four lives and destroyed more than 100 homes, sheds and other buildings, as well as the town of Klamath River. And it was devastating. I didn't think I'd get emotional. I don't get emotional about stuff and it's material things, you know. But when the, you hear my next door neighbors died, uh, Chuck and his wife, they couldn't get out because they always locked their gate and he couldn't get out. And then my other neighbor died, uh, Uncle Johnny. And this is when within less than a half a mile. The ash and the smoke was so thick that uh, you couldn't hardly breathe. Um, I have severe uh, lung issues, COPD. I'm on oxygen at night. And uh, it was a trial and an effort to pack up on Sunday. I was not in an immediate evacuation zone but I needed to get out of there just to be able to breathe. The McKinney fire near the Oregon border was 10% contained as of Wednesday night. Firefighters expected Thursday to fully surround a 1,000-acre spot fire on the northern edge of the McKinney fire. Officials say about 1,300 residents remain under evacuation orders. And still to come, talk show host Alex Jones admits that branding the Sandy Hook shooting as a staged hoax was wrong. He says despite seeking to distance himself from his previous statements, the media continues to ignore his stance. And housing prices still growing, but many wondering if there will be a bad awakening and a market crash. We speak to an expert right after the break. The Nation Speaks, we don't just scratch the surface. We want to go wide and deep. Our viewers come away with a much richer understanding of the issues of the day. We really make a big effort to bring on different voices onto the show. We don't just talk to experts and newsmakers, which of course are extremely important, but we also want to hear from the American people. So the people who are impacted by the policies and issues that we're talking about, because what they have to say is just as important to the national conversation. Welcome back. Talk show host Alex Jones testified yesterday that he now understands it was irresponsible of him to declare the Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre a hoax. Jones told jurors that the shooting was 100% real and that years ago he sought to distance himself from the theory that the shooting was staged. Here's NTD's Cost Temines with more on this. Jones was speaking a day after the parents of a six-year-old boy who was killed in a 2012 attack testified about the suffering, death threats and harassment they've endured. I have said before that there have been so many lies and so many things in the past and I was under a lot of pressure and I truly, when I said those statements, when I say something I mean it, that I really couldn't believe that it was totally staged at that point and I was basing that off of really Steve Pachinik, who is a, has been a very prestigious person. Jones now admits that the shooting was not a staged hoax. As I said on the radio yesterday, and as I said here yesterday, uh, it's 100% real. And the media still ran with lies that I was saying it wasn't real on air yesterday. It's incredible. They won't let me take it back. They just want to keep me in the position of being the Sandy Hook man. The plaintiffs say an apology wouldn't suffice and that Jones needs to be held accountable for repeatedly spreading falsehoods about the attack. They are seeking at least $150 million in the trial. Testimony in the trial, which is in its second week, concluded around midday Wednesday. Jones's attorney, Andino Reynal, says the plaintiffs didn't prove that his client's actions and words caused actual harm to Heslin and Lewis. He added it's fair to infer that someone else weaponized what Jones has said about Sandy Hook and convinced them that Alex Jones was responsible for their grief. Jones was the only person who testified in his own defense. 
Deliberations will resume Thursday as the jury decides on the amount of money to award the plaintiffs. They must then decide if Jones must also pay punitive damages. Cost MNS, NTD News. Housing prices are still climbing, but slowing at a record pace. That's according to Black Knight. At the same time, Redfin reports that areas where prices soared during the pandemic are most vulnerable to downturn. Those are also the areas where people relocated to the most, like Boise, Phoenix or Tampa. So what's next? I spoke to an expert to find out. Joining me to discuss the housing market is Jeff Musgrave. He is the managing broker and owner of the Musgrave Group in Tampa, Florida. It's great to have you, Jeff. Great to be on again. So we saw that home prices were still growing in June, although certainly slower. But how long do you think until home prices will drop again? Well, we've definitely seen a slowdown in the amount of purchasers in the market. We've also kind of seen a little slowdown with regards to the amount of inventory hitting the market. Uh, So I think we're going to see a little bit of a taper off coming into kind of slow season in the real estate market here. But I do think we might have a little bit of an uptick once uh, tax returns and school gets out again next year. I think next summer is going to be a little strong. And then I think we're going to see a little more of a, a decline in prices after next summer. Oh, but you're mentioning that, you know, slower demand, but still higher prices. So for home sellers, is that still a good time for them to put their home on the market? Well, what we're seeing actually is a lot of home sellers are looking at other options with uh, the rental rates actually increasing as much as they have just based on the demand. Um, And also with inflation, uh, we're seeing a lot of homeowners asking us the questions of, should I rent my home? Is that a better option? And so I think that's what's caused a little bit of the constraint on the demand we've been seeing as far as, uh, or the supply we've been seeing as far as homes hitting the market this month. That's a very good point, renting the home. And Redfin says that the Florida housing market, for instance, is most vulnerable in an economic downturn. So in places like Tampa, you know, where you're based, should homeowners be worried to lose a significant value of their homes? Well, I think you're going to be looking at uh, the homeowners that may uh, be a little more over leveraged, uh, some that own maybe a, a, a first and a second home, maybe they rent one out, uh, maybe they're a little uh, too far over leveraged, I think should maybe um, just be a little more aware. I don't think, um, obviously, I think we were named the second highest appreciation, uh, I believe it was a study done by Zillow, uh, market that had appreciation of home values. So obviously with how high we've grown, um, there's obviously that chance for it to roll back. But I think a lot of that has been due to the the uh, demand for the Tampa Bay market. Uh, even with you know the Water Street project going on downtown, uh, Jeff Vinnick and Bill Gates project just nearing completion of phase one, they're looking to roll out uh, the beginning of phase two. I just think with the amount of money that's being being poured into the Tampa urban metro, I don't think we're going to see prices in Tampa uh, declining as sharply as some of the other markets around the country. Mm, interesting. And so just before we wrap it up, I do want to know this because I see, I hear conflicting views about it and people are worried that we have a housing crash on our hands. So I'm asking you, what do you think this is, market correction or crash? Uh, Definitely more of a slight correction, and I would say slight. I would definitely uh, stress that. Uh, I'm reading some of the articles, and it's just not what we're seeing uh, from what they're saying around the country. It's not what we're seeing here in Tampa. Uh, For example, we just had a a property. uh, It was a fixer-upper that listed in Brandon uh, last week. Uh, Within four days, we had 11 offers, four of those cash over asking with no inspection period, no contingencies at all um, by local investors. So I think that people are seeing what's going on in Tampa, and I think they're really getting excited and getting behind the vision uh, that Jane has put out there for the city and really like just buying into the growth that's happening here. Mm, I think that will be reassuring to hear from any. So thanks a lot, Jeff Musgrave, the Musgrave Group. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. And Walmart is laying off about 200 corporate employees. In a statement, the retail giant says it is updating its structure and evolving select roles. Walmart Walmart says it is still adding jobs in several areas, including e-commerce, advertising, and supply chain. This comes just days after the company issued a warning about its profit outlook. Walmart, Walmart says it expects customers to spend less in the coming months because of inflation. As travelers return to the skies in droves following a pause in the pandemic, airlines and airports worldwide are grappling to meet demand. But are recession fears and soaring inflation impacting that travel boom as consumers weigh airfare, hotel and gas prices? 
Here's why the travel industry appears to be thriving amid a possible economic downturn. As the peak summer travel season winds down, travel experts say Americans are still spending money on their vacations, despite historic inflation and recession fears. While consumers are starting to pull back uh, on some discretionary spending, some things they don't have to spend money on, it's not holding true for travel. Several travel industry leaders say demand is still high. Scott Kays, founder of the flight aggregator website Scott's Cheap Flights, points to several factors, including a rise in credit card travel spending. American Express uh, no noted that travel spending was up uh, nearly 150 percent in the, uh, the previous quarter. That's despite fears of an economic downturn on the horizon. Experts blame that on so-called revenge travel, the huge travel boom following years of lost vacations during a pandemic slump. Meanwhile, Airbnb says reservations are soaring. On Tuesday, the company announced a 24% increase in bookings in the three months that ended in June, compared to the same time period in 2019. And when it comes to hitting the road, gas prices are declining. On Wednesday, the U.S. national average price of a gallon of regular gas was $4.16, according to AAA. Compared to a month ago, that was $4.81. And experts say cheaper prices are ahead. While motorists may be incentivized by prices that have been falling, more decreases lie ahead. On Wednesday, OPEC, the world's oil exporting countries and its allies, agreed to a tiny increase in production next month amid fears that a global recession will hurt demand. Will we have to pay more for olive oil soon? Severe heat and drought is threatening Tuscany's famed crops of olives and grapes. Growers say the heart of Italy's olive oil and wine industry could see a sharp decline in production this year. Farmers in Tuscany, the heart of Italy's wine and olive oil industry, are battling to salvage this year's crop from the ravages of drought and heat waves. The lack of rainfall since spring has affected even plants that thrive in hot and dry conditions. In San Castiano, near Florence, the soil, parched by the scorching sun, is not producing enough olives. Without water, many flowers fall to the ground before becoming oily fruit. Grower Filippo Legnauli fears oil production this year could drop by as much as 50 to 60 percent. We expect a poor season in terms of quantity of olive oil production. Unfortunately, climatic issues had a decisive influence. We had a very dry spring with practically no rainfall, and this happened at a crucial time during the transition from flower to fruit. We had excellent flowering, but unfortunately, the lack of water hindered the process. In Castellina, in Chianti, September is normally the month of the grape harvest, as it is throughout the country. But with extreme and prolonged temperatures, the bunches of grapes have ripened earlier than expected. We have smaller grapes, and we expect the number of grapes to be lower than the average of the last few years, probably in line with last year's. Now we have to wait and hope for good rainfall because the vineyard cannot reach the harvest without rain. We hope for healthy, abundant rainfall, even staggered in two or three waves. A few years ago, olive trees and vines were mainly the preserve of hot and arid areas such as Sicily. Now even Val d'Aosta in the very north, famous for its ski resorts and mountains, can produce its own oil, the farmers say. And coming up, NASA introduces its plan for getting back to the moon. The agency says its ultimate goal is sending people to Mars. And police are trailing a suspect on the 65 interstate highway. It is black and white and has been said to be eating the grass. More on that right when we come back. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. Cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American Carson Graves? Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. Navigating a world of economic madness, you need to have the right guide. What do today's decisions mean for your tomorrow? We ask why, what's the alternative? Uncover the deeper reasons and the hidden influences and highlight the real opportunities for profit. 
At Entity Business, we connect the dots for you. Good evening. Thank you. Welcome back. NASA announced its launch of Artemis 1 and the Orion spacecraft. The Orion spacecraft will travel a distance further than any spacecraft built by humans before. The first in a series of increasingly complex missions, Artemis 1 will be an uncrewed flight test that will provide a foundation for deep space exploration. Astronauts will live and work in deep space and we'll develop the science and technology to send the first humans to Mars. We're going to Mars and we're going back to the moon in order to learn to live, to work, to survive. How do you keep humans alive in those hostile conditions? CubeSats will be testing innovative propulsion technologies, studying space weather, analyzing the effects of radiation on living organisms, one of my favorite experiments, and providing high-resolution imagery of the Earth and Moon. The mission will be over a million miles long, traveling to the Moon and back in the uncrewed flight test. The experiments will be a great step forward for deep space travel. The spacecraft is slated to launch on August 29th. Officials say they expect at least 100,000 visitors for the launch's first window. With sold-out hotels, excitement seems to grow by the day. Now the life of back to the life on Earth, roofers in Kansas did a great job of removing the roof tiles of a house on Monday. But unfortunately for everyone involved, it was the wrong house. When the owner of the house, Stephen Cornspan, arrived home, the roofers had clocked out for the day. They left his roof tiles in a pile on the ground leaving the once functioning roof as just a wooden frame. Cornspan called the police, of course, and his, and his insurance company, but things are now resolved. Luckily, the roofing company paid for repairs, which cost around $6,000. The owner says he will be firing the men involved. The roof was fixed on Tuesday. I bet that homeowner was shocked when he saw what happened, and I bet the drivers in our next story were shocked, too, when they saw a cow that found its way onto the highway. A police chase breaks out in Alabama, but it was a very slow chase. A cow cut loose for the day and went for a stroll down the Interstate 65. Highway drivers hadn't planned on attending a rodeo on Wednesday, but that is what they got. Police maintained close control on the cow because a hefty bovine can do serious damage, which means the police really have a stake in getting her home safely. You know, I've been on that highway before, but I've never seen a cow on it. I've never seen a cow. I'm just kidding. I saw a donkey before. Really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, but that's it for today's program. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great day. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.